Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is entitled On Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. This is lesson number nine in that series for November 26th of 2022, entitled Contrary Passages. Hmm. You make a lesson about contrary passages? That's an interesting topic. With a question mark. With a question mark, yeah. As usual, we like to begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come once again to discuss um, some issues in scriptures, that issues that uh, have uh, confused perhaps and, and misled some people. Help us to represent you correctly as we study together. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So what's a contrary passage? Have you ever had a discussion with someone who believes one of these passages, someone who believes that one of these passages proves the immortality of the soul? How should we deal with such issues? Well, careful Bible scholars need to consider everything in Scripture, not just the passages that support the things we or they believe. We must never forget that we are in the final and critical stages of the great controversy. Satan is doing everything he possibly can to confuse and mislead people. In order to deal with his misinformation campaign, we need to understand it. Jim? First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But have reference for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. From the American Bible Society, 1992. Good news translation. Okay, do you feel like you're ready to do that? Well, that's what the Lord challenges us through, through uh, Peter to do. Um, Paul said something similar, 2 Timothy 4. Charles? Yes. If solemnly, I solemnly urge you to preach the message, to insist upon preaching it, uh, where, whether the time is right or not, to convince Reproach and encourage as you teach with all patience. The time will soon come when people will not listen to sound doctrine, but will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will tell them what they are itching to hear. Are there any people around that you know of that are waiting for people to tell them what they're itching to hear? Well, don't we tend to get together with people that we agree with? Isn't, yeah. isn't that people that, are, that, that we're itching to hear? Okay, we must remember that it is impossible to stamp out evil, especially Satan's misinformation, because he will respond by just adding more misinformation. We know that historically. The correct way to deal with him is to tell the truth. The truth will always win in the end. So the correct response to someone who believes in error is to lovingly present the truth. Sin cannot be stamped out, it must be crowded out with truth. From Myra? Desire of Ages, page uh, 353, Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth. He spoke it always in love. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave in needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. Okay, so which passages in the Bible are the most contrary regarding the immortality of the soul? Well, what about the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Oh boy. <laughs> Gordon, you want to take that That's one on? One. That's one of them, Luke 16. Verses 19 to 31, Jesus said, There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus. Not the Lazarus that we're going to talk about later. No. But Lazarus, covered with sores, who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, where he was in great pain, 
he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. <clears throat> Again, we're remembering that this is Jesus was saying this. Yes. So it has extra weight, right? We're going to talk about that in a moment. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue because I am in great pain here in this fire. But Abraham said, remember my son that in your lifetime you were given all the good things while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he is enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there is a deep pit lying between us so that those who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so. Nor can anyone cross over to us from where you are. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, where I have five brothers. Let them go and warn them, so that they, at least, will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, Your brothers have Moses and the prophets, that is the Bible, to warn them. Your brothers should listen to what they say. The rich man answered, That is not enough, Father Abraham. But if someone were to rise from the death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, again, the Bible, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from the dead. That's from Good News Bible. Okay, so now the question here is when we get a story like that, should that be taken literally? Well, we have an example, of, uh, to, to the tail end of that passage there, have an example when, when Lazarus was sick and then was raised back to life. The other, other Lazarus. Yeah, the other Lazarus. We'll get the, to that. The, the, the friend of Jesus and Mary and Martha's uh, brother. When, when that happened, nothing, there was no salutary uh, effect. No. In fact, they, the religious leaders plotted to kill, to kill Jesus. Lazarus. And Lazarus. So what good is it? And Jesus. It, it, well, well, later they did, but to, to begin with, if somebody they won't listen to the most, excuse me, what did he say? If you, if you, uh, if they will not, if somebody will rise from the dead, then they'll they'll uh, they'll listen. <laughs> History shows it them that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the parable clearly teaches that our eternal destiny is determined by what we do in this life. That seems to be the major point. Okay, there is no second chance for salvation. This parable, and I put that in quotation marks, was spoken to a population who were mostly heathen and who believed in hell fire. We need to know, this is an important point to, to, to notice. There were no hospitals and there were no public or national welfare programs in Jesus' day. God entrusted riches to some human beings so they could use those riches for the benefit of their fellow humans by sharing to meet the needs of the four, poor. During these last few months of his life on earth, many people do not recognize this, Jesus was ministering to the people of Perea on the other side or that east side of Jordan. And why was he doing that? To keep away from the authorities. Because yeah, the people in Judea and the people in Galilee were trying to arrest him. The Pharisees and Sadducees were, mm -hmm. trying, were plotting to kill him. The people of Samaria, Perea, and Decapolis were mostly non-Jews. Now, there were a lot of Jews there, too, but mostly non-Jews. They were of many nationalities, including Greeks. Luke was the only gospel writer who wrote about Jesus' extensive ministry to these areas, and you can read about that in Luke 9, 51 to 1910. Ten of the most prominent cities in the area had been so influenced by Greek culture that they were considered to be Greek cities, known as Decapolis. That's what it says in the King James. Decapolis is a Greek word which means ten cities. Most of the people that Jesus was speaking to at that time were pagan and had many pagan beliefs. Therefore, Jesus used one of their common beliefs as a framework for an important truth he wished to teach. This rich man claimed to be a descendant of Abraham and depended on that for his salvation. And of course, how many of the Jews depended on their descent from Abraham? All of them. All of them. Many of them, anyway. He even prayed to Abraham. He spent his life on earth pleasing self. In the story when he was represented as ending up in hell, he realized his mistakes and asked at least for some additional warning to be sent to his brothers. In doing that, he was implying that God had not provided sufficient warning. 
That's what he's really implying. Think about it. Proof of the correctness of Abraham's response to the rich man came a short time later when Lazarus of Bethany that Jim was talking about was indeed raised after being dead four days, as we read in John 11, 39. It only made the Jews, the Jewish leaders, the, 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 you know, the people were excited, but the Jewish leaders, it made them angrier. They were determined to kill him. Well, God has provided the truth to us through his word. As all the evidence we need is available from this inspired source. We do not need miracles of any kind to establish our faith. Furthermore, most miracles can be easily counterfeited by the devil. There are many things about this parable that show that it was not a true story. Is it possible for people from heaven and hell to speak back and forth to each other? I mean, where do you think hell is located? Where is heaven located? The well, new earth will be here after a thousand years. Of yes. And hell will be here too, as it turns out. If so, what could there be that separates those two locations that would be impossible for even God to cross? He said, no one from here can cross over. Really? The only things that can separate us from God permanently are our own sinful choices and the character that develops as a result. This is not a physical barrier. Jesus was not suggesting that we should believe in the doctrine of hellfire. He was using a common belief among the people to whom he was talking as a way of teaching some important truths. The idea that souls go directly to heaven or hell is in direct contradiction with the rest of scriptures. And this is an important point. There is an ancient story from Egypt that more or less parallels this story. Jesus may have been paraphrasing that story to teach a point. Remember that Jesus was speaking to an area of Perea on the east side of the Jordan, outside of Jewish territory. There were, of course, many Jews who lived there, but it was basically a Greek-oriented area. So Ellen White comments, when the rich man solicited additional evidence for his brothers, he was plainly told that should this evidence be giving, given, they would not be persuaded. His request cast a reflection on God. It was as if the rich man had said, if you had more thoroughly warned me, I should not now be here. Abraham, in his answer to this request, is represented as saying, your brothers have been sufficiently warned. Light has been given them, but they would not see. Truth has been presented to them, but they would not hear. That's Christ's obvious lessons, 264, 265. I have a question. Yes. So, maybe God, maybe it was appropriate to use for the Pereans and the Greeks at that time, but why did God have to let it into the Bible for us? Yes. For us in 2022, mm -hmm. for us in in the preceding years and the future years, yep. it makes it a problem. Well, there's one pos there's one or two possibilities. One possibility is that uh, Luke, of course, was Greek, who recorded this story, and he well, heard yes, it. But but again, why does it, is it there for us? Yeah. You, you, sermons have true. been preached on the, on this topic. I mean, yes, sir. This and, is and you interact with the uh, very intelligent, well learned, well read uh, Protestants. Yeah, they're going to go this to this it. one. This yeah. is it. Well, that's so, Billy Graham's favorite text. There so, you are. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Oh, so many Billy Graham's he all knows over. When he dies, he goes into the bosom of Abraham. Right. right, right. So uh, the bosom of Abraham is a, a man's hairy chest. <laughs> it's a crowded place. <laughs> to, uh, I think Gordon's, in the, I, I, we were reading um, the text that uh, St. Paul says, they're itching to hear. Mm -hmm. They want yeah. to, because this is convenient Christianity. Clemency for all, you know. This is open border. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, except it is an open border because you can't cross from here to there. <laughs> yes. And you can't cross from there to here. Yeah, right. It's a closed border. It's a closed border, but they want an open border. That, that could be just an example so. of how little uh, control God gives, uh, has to own the Bible. I mean, you, you, the, I've got thousands of Bible, or well over a thousand different translations, right. and there's problems with every one of them. Mm -hmm. So, are you going to say that God preserved it? When you got to dig, dig things, things out of a, a cave and, and earthen jars, uh, they were put there, what, 
You call that preservation? Years. Right, right. Two thousand years ago. Two thousand years ago. I probably do a better job of preservation than than most people. Have. <laughs> is is this parable story related anywhere else in the Bible? No. No. That you could compare it. I mean, Luke is the only one that recorded it. Luke is the only one that records it. Well, he's the only Greek. But that's the that's the strength, quote unquote, for most of these people. You see. Uh, did the reformers believe in eternal hell? I didn't. Some, some. I don't think more, uh, Luther did. Did he? Yeah. Um, he? He had some. I don't remember. I think. Yeah, I think he did. did he, the burning fires. Or yeah. The, Could the spirits that? Well, go ahead, P, Gordon. What was what was the name of the early that, American preacher that? Oh, dangling by a thin yeah. thread over the fires of hell, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Bring your money. Bring your money. I, I, when I speak with this folk, I say, hey, look, we need to take a look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture. The great controversy. Does this yeah. feed into, does it not? But then no. you go back they to the They have no question. idea. Why is it there? Yeah. <laughs> if it, well, if I, it I, I suspect it it's there because Luke, as a Greek physician, and there was a lot of connection between Egypt in those days and Greece and Rome. I suspect that he used this story because they knew about this thing, and this was a common belief that people had. And Jesus said, "Well, let's let's talk about that." And he is what 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 would help us would be if we had what Jesus said before that and what Jesus said after that. Right. And we don't really have that, so. Could this okay, again, it was fine for Jesus to talk to them about it, but yeah. Jonathan Edwards, sinners. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan yeah. Edwards, right. right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Could the spirits that some people claim live in the afterlife have eyes and fingers and tongues which even feel thirst? Could heaven be a place of joy, peace, and calmness and love if we are to be constantly exposed to screams and pain of those living in so-called hell? That's the kind of heaven you want to go to? Doesn't make sense. Jim, you ready to take on? From the Bible study guide, we can be thankful that this parable does not re represent reality. We serve a God who doesn't torture s someone for eternity. Roy Gain lists three major problems with an ever-burning hell. Number one, would God feed fruit from the tree of life to the wicked to keep them alive in, heaven, in hell? If so, this would contradict the biblical teaching that only those who are saved enjoy the right uh, to this fruit. Revelation 22:14. Consider Genesis 3, where God barred sinful Adam and Eve from the tree of life precisely to prevent them from living forever. Revelation 22, verses 22 to 24. But that's actually in, an incorrect, yeah. even though that's what the Bible study guide says. Oh, is that what it was? It's actually Genesis 3, It should be, should be Genesis 24. 3, yeah. Well, okay. And it, as a result, they, di they died, Genesis 5, 5. So the, let, let's think about the implication of that. So they're saying, okay, if these people are living apart from God, he's going he's gonna to have to do something to keep them alive. Now, Gain made it very literal here that they have to feed them fruit from the tree of life. but. I mean, the truth is that God is keeping the devil and all of his evil angels alive even today. If he, if he unplugged them, they would be dead right now. The, the answer to the question is, why does evil exist? If, mm -hmm. if evil becomes a separation from God, who's keeping it going? God's yeah. keeping evil going. Yeah. Why? Well, so the well, well, intelligent creatures can learn. Yeah. yeah. If, you do, if, if everything's uh, you, you're carried around on a velvet pillow, uh, you never learn anything. You've got to develop some muscle. Sometimes the muscle up here. <laughs> that Charles, you want? Go ahead. Is that, is that why Eve chose to take the fruit? Well, she was. She had a predisposition before she before she the, she, the serpents talked to her. I think she. I think she. It was working on her a long time before. Well, we don't know. We don't. Yeah, you know, there's speculation, but yeah. it's it's not. Okay, uh, Charles, you want to try. Expl explanation number two. This is, okay, number two. In Revelation chapter 20, the lake of fire that destroys the wicked covers a vast area on the surface of the earth around, around 
around the New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. <laughs> Revelation 28 to 10. There is no indication in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 that the molten lake remains as a permanent feature the new new earth. Are you hoping to live in a new Jerusalem that just sits sort of in a in a lake of fire? Well, I mean, kind of these people, if they really, if their dreams are true, then they're trying to sleep. No, maybe there is no sleep. We don't know. But, you know, they want to rest. No, no, no. These guys are screaming, give, us, give me a little water. Give me a little water. Well, like <laughs> uh, Lazarus, he says, dip your finger. Yeah, dip your finger. Yeah. Right, right, right. And what good was, a uh, dip your finger. I mean, what good would it do if you were really in fire? So that's, that's why, go, going back to the same thing, we need to take a look at the bigger picture, you know, the great controversy. Does this really fit in, or is it really trying to teach us something here? Yeah. So. Well, the whole, this whole thing is based upon a, the presupposition back in Genesis 3. Yeah. You shall not die. Yeah. Ever. And, and, and if you give it, yeah. God's going to give blessings to the good guys, what's yeah. he going to do to the bad ones? Well, yeah. he, he, they don't die, so yeah. you've got to have some place of torture. And, and, but that's the question, you see. Do we have inherent immortality, or don't we? Is, does God have to keep each one of us alive? If we have to keep each one of us alive, then we've got, we've got a, a tyrant as a god, if this is going to be true. Well, according to this folk, you cannot die. Even yeah. he cannot kill you. So, the, yeah. Yeah, even he cannot kill you. Yeah. Now, but th think about this. When the serpent says you're not going to die. Yeah, there you are. But was it? Was it Based upon, you remember the, the thing on, uh, on trading and so forth and investments, it says prior history is no indicator of future results. Yeah. So when the serpent, and, the, and my, our understanding from what we've been able to read from Ellen White and from the Bible, there's no indication that there had ever been death in the universe. No. So when the serpent says, Satan through the serpent, I believe, says, uh, Nobody had died, He's, but he didn't understand God's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. okay? Now then when he did say, you're going to be like the gods, that was a true statement. Mm -hmm. because every, in one, in very, uh, one very limited way. Well, it's pretty big. Everybody oh, but you le learns, learns about, uh, learns of how the, you'll be like the gods, knowing good and evil. Yeah, that and, part, yes, that okay? part. But the first part, from the point of view of the serpent, there'd been no death, so he, he just says, what's happened in the past ain't gonna change, things keep on going on. Yeah. So. Okay, Myra, you gonna give us the next one? Okay, number three. Those who are thrown into the lake of fire suffer the second death, which is the last death, Revelation 20, 14, 15, and Revelation 21, 8. Therefore they die they do not go on living eternally in an internal, infernal misery. That's yeah. from Roy Gain. So I, ha I have a question about this. So his statement at the beginning is there are three major problems with an ever burning hell. Mm -hmm. How about a hell that just lasts as long as we deserve? <laughs> well, well mm -hmm. he wasn't addressing that question. <laughs> yeah. But we need to sometime. Yes. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, maybe part of the, part of the problem, though, also is a mistranslation, misunderstanding of what the word hell means. It was, yeah, exactly. was a re reference to a garbage dump. Yeah. Gehenna. Could you know that you had a loved one, maybe even a child, who was suffering in hell, quote hell, and you were able to see them or even talk to them and still be happy in heaven? That would be hell for a person, wouldn't it? Yeah. Notice this comment from a non-Adventist. This is uh, from the Bible study guide. This story was probably, quote, a parable which made use of current Jewish thinking and is not intended to teach anything about the state of the dead, close quote. That's from G.E. Ladd, and the reference is given. Yeah, the new Bible, but not an Adventist comment. So, once again, we ask, what was the purpose of this parable? We've been trying to work on that. Clearly, our current financial or social status is not a determinant of our future rewards. That seems, seems to be pretty clear. And two, the eternal destiny of each person is decided in this life. It cannot be reversed in the afterlife in one way or another. And we're going to go to that, into that in considerable more detail 
in our discussion for next week. It seems clear that Jesus told the story of the rich man Lazarus in order to demonstrate the seriousness of the choices that we make while we are still alive on this earth. This was not intended to be an informational story. The choices we make in this life will determine our status in the future life. It's interesting to notice that Jesus named the poor beggar Lazarus. Amazingly, sometime later, he literally raised his friend Lazarus back to life and it still not, did not convince the Jewish leaders to believe in him. In fact, they were even more determined to kill him. And I don't know whether Jesus himself did, but it seems like those stories, two stories should be linked. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, sure, it's just a matter of a name, but there's, there's so many crossovers. Uh, Jesus chose the name. Yeah. In the parable, he chose the name, obviously, yeah. There are no hints in the context of the story that Jesus intended to talk about the state of the dead. That's a significant point. Many of the Jews believed that if one was rich, that was a proof of the fact that God was blessing him and that thus he must be a good person. I mean, if you're rich, God is blessing you, you must be a good person, right? That's current philosophy for today and for thousands of years ago. Yeah. The Pharisees and the Sadducees loved to make that claim because they were rich. They often became rich by using evil means to cheat the poor. The details of the story also prove, this is from our Bible study guide, the idea of its being a literal description of a burning hell. First of all, it would be impossible for someone who is burning alive to feel refreshed by his tongue being cooled by a finger that was dipped in water. I mean, how would that refresh? Additionally, the close distance between heaven and hell would make it impossible for anyone to enjoy the his time in heaven if he could at any point have a conversation with a loved one right beside him who is burning for eternity. The promise from the book of Revelation that there would be no more pain, sorrow, or tears in heaven would never be realized from our Bible study guide. So what did Lazarus say that might help us to understand the truth about the rich man and Lazarus? Jim? Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 to 24. Just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have been have rebelled against me. The worm that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sign of the, excuse me, the sight of them will be disgusting to the whole human race. Good news Bible. Wow. Okay, very important to notice that while this passage is clearly not a parable because it seems to describe actual events in heaven, there's one very important difference. The worms and the fires in Isaiah's description are all consuming what? Dead bodies. Dead bodies. So this is clearly, I mean, Jesus is obviously referring to this. This is obviously a picture suggested by the continuously burning trash dump outside of ancient Jerusalem, which by the way was called what? Gehenna. Gehenna, from which we derive our word hell. Another passage in scripture that has led to some believing in the immortality of the soul is found in Luke 23, 43. Charles. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today, well, okay, <laughs> truly I tell you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise, in the International Standard Version. Okay, and many, many versions, okay. Yes. I've, I have found, I put a collection of eight of them where they says, some says, uh, has no commas, some has a comma, I say unto you today, comma, you'll be with me in paradise, mm -hmm. and some of them have a comma before and after today. Comma before and after. Yeah. Okay. So, but the traditional is, I say unto you today, excuse me, a comma, you'll be with me in paradise. I did that wrong. That's the traditional I, translation. The traditional is yeah. comma today. Right. Today you will be with me in the yeah. paradise. That's traditional. Uh, but Translation. Yeah, we know there were no punctuations okay. in the Greek. 
So. It's impaired, and we'll, we'll talk about more in a little bit later. It's important to compare this passage with John 20, 17, and John 14, 1 through 3. See how they fit with what that comment. John 20, 17 says, Do not hold on to me, Jesus told her, because I have yet not yet gone up back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him who is my Father and their Father, my God and their God. Good News Bible. Okay, this happened on Sunday. Clearly not the same day as the resurrection, as the crucifixion. Yes. So, and it's possible that the other, the, the, the thief that was Jesus spoke to may not even have been dead by Sunday. And then John 14, 1 through 3, Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be with me, so you will be where I am. Good News Bible. Would it be fair for Jesus to take the thief to heaven on that same day of the crucifixion, Friday, when he told his disciples they wouldn't be taken to heaven only at the second coming? Doesn't seem right, does it? According to biblical and Jewish reckoning that Friday ended at sunset. And what happened to the thieves before sunset? Their legs were broken because they were still alive. They may not have died for several days, even though they were taken down from the crosses. So clearly, I mean, are we going to suggest that this thief was taken to heaven while his body was still here alive? Doesn't make any sense, huh? Well, here's what John 19, 31 to 35 says about that. Then the Jewish authorities asked Pilate to allow them to break the legs of the men who had been crucified and take the bodies down from the crosses. They requested this because it was Friday and they did not want the bodies to stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, especially since the coming Sabbath was especially holy. So the soldiers went and broke the legs of the first man and then the other man who had been crucified with Jesus. So why did they break their legs? So they do not run away. Well, so yes, they but... They die quicker. They lose blood and die. Yeah, but the real reason, I mean, the, in terms of our story here, the reason they broke their legs is they were still alive. Yeah. They were still alive when they broke their legs. Um, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs, okay? One of the soldiers, however, plunged his spear into Jesus' side, and at once blood and water poured out. The one who saw this happen has spoken of it so that you also may believe. What he said is true and he knows that he speaks the truth. And of course, what's, who are we talking about here? We're talking about the Apostle John who was there, wasn't he? With Jesus' mother. The Greek language, as it was written in New Testament times, and Jim, this is one of the things you commented about, often did not have any separation between words and there was no punctuation. So the question in Luke 23, 43 is whether the comma should be before the world today, word today or after it. And who, may, who makes that decision? The translators. The translators. Unfortunately, most of the people who have translated our English Bibles believe in an immortal soul. And so they put the comma before the word today. Re the rest of the Bible, the context and the comparison from other passages by Luke suggested, suggests that the comma should be after the word today. So what did Paul mean when he wrote in Philippians 1, 21 through 24 and 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18? What did he have in mind when he expected to be with Christ or with the Lord? For what is life? To me, it is Christ. Death then will bring more. But if by continuing to live, I can do more worthwhile work, then I am not sure which I should choose. If I'm pulled in two directions, I want very much to live and this life and be with Christ, which is far more be far better than, uh, thing. But 
for your sake, it is much more important that I remain alive. Good news, Bible. First Thessalonians uh, 4, 13 through 18. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. <clears throat> what we are teaching now, you now, is that the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day of the Lord, on the day of the Lord comes, will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be a shout of command and the archangel's voice, the um, the sound of God's trumpet and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Jesus Christ will rise in the first. Then we who are alive, were living at the time will be gathered up among them in the clouds of to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. Okay. Clearly, Paul was driven with the passionate, with the passion to live in Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and with Christ after his second coming, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. For the apostle, not even death could break the assurance of being, uh, of belonging to his Savior and Lord. As he said in the epistle to the Romans, neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Romans 14, 8. That's from our Bible study guide. From a, for, from a careful look at these passages, it is clear that Jesus was talking about taking the saints back with him to heaven at his second coming. But that should not prevent us from having a close relationship with him even today, as we just read. Charles just read for us. Most of us will recognize that Paul had a very close relationship with Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4.8 clearly states that he was looking forward to the victory prize that, quote, the Lord, the righteous judge, would give him on that day, that is, at the second coming. These were some of the last words Paul wrote. Reviewing passages like 1 Corinthians 9.27 and 2 Corinthians 11.21-33, if you had lived a life like Paul's, could you at least sometimes have longed for living, for leaving this life and being in heaven? If you remember, we don't have time now in our schedule here to read those passages, but when you read everything that happened to Paul, he had been beaten within a hair's breadth of his life five times that we know about. He'd been shipwrecked. He'd been attacked by foreigners. He'd been attacked by Jews. I mean, is it any wonder that he kind of wish that he could <laughs> depart and be with the Lord. Another passage in scriptures that has puzzled many and has led to some strange ideas is found in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 20. <clears throat> is that mine? Um, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy you are. Do not be afraid of anyone and do not worry. But have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. But do it with the gentleness, with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. For it is better to suffer for doing good. If this should be God's will, then, then for doing evil, then for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all. A good man on the behalf of sinners in order to lead, to, lead you to God. He, he was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually. And his spiritual existence he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. 
Whoa. So that's yeah. the passage we want to look at, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, these were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God and had waited patiently. Who had, who had when not, he waited. When he waited patiently during the days of Noah, that Noah was building the boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved by the water. So it's interesting to notice that because of the way the Greek is written in verse 19, that's the, the part where it says um, he was put to death physically, but made alive spiritually, and in his spiritual existence. Uh, because of the way the Greek is written in verse 19, some scholars believe it should read, in which Enoch went and preached. And I, I was part of a master's degree dissertation or thesis that I, I wrote many years ago and uh, three <laughs> two or three years ago 20 or 30 if or Jesus more. or more <laughs> if Jesus had somehow in his spiritual existence first Peter 3 19 apart from his body traveled to hell to preach to this embodied spirits of the antediluvians why didn't he also preach to the other sinners who were there I mean the story just doesn't hold together if you if you look at it carefully so it, and so it, the Greek said, in which also, and you just have to have the tiniest little change in the Greek to make it Enoch, being the one who preached there and not, not Christ. So I, I'm, I'm quite sure that's what happened. Someone just was copying, maybe a little bit carelessly, and uh, left, uh, that's what happened. So is that the different part, one of the differences between the New Testament that's kind of sloppily copied in the Old Testament that was very carefully copied? Well, yeah, now you're, you're tempting me way beyond my ability to resist. Short, short. Okay. <laughs> the Old Testament, we have very, we have relatively few copies. And partly the reason is it was copied very, very carefully. And later on, if any part of it got damaged somehow, whatever, they would copy it carefully again and throw away the old copy. So we have relatively few copies, but they're very precise. There's not very much variation. There is some, but not much. By contrast, in the New Testament, because of differing circumstances at the time when it was written, we have lots of variations, but we also have thousands and thousands of copies. So if, if and they, all, they come from different places, so that if you, if you see a mistake what appears to be a mistake here, you've got a lot of other places to check, and and since they don't come from the same source, I mean, if a mistake is this, this line of, of copying over here has a mistake, you can go over and look at this line, and that line, and that line, and you can almost always, I would say always, no, yeah, no, it's, it should be this way. Well, let's put into the equation Jeremiah 8, verse 8, the, the lying pen has made it into a lie. And in Matthew 23, 13 and following, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, you're hypocrites. And yeah. seven times he said that. They referred to him as the scribes and Pharisees. Who were the scribes and Pharisees? Were they not the copyists? Weren't they part of it? Yeah, but a, a very... See... The, the the thing is that the old they would be that might be a, a possibly appropriate for talking about the Old Testament. It's not talking about the New Testament because they're not the ones who copied the New Testament. So this thing couldn't possibly have anything to do with that passage because this is all New Testament stuff, and they had nothing to do with the New Testament. What did Jesus refer to when he said the the scribes and Pharisees are hypocrites? Well, there's all kinds of reasons for that. That's another story. Oh. But it has, it has nothing to do with the way the New Testament is copied. And we think that the New Testament hasn't been tampered with? Well, I'm sure there's people... We're, we're going to talk about a time when that... In fact, we'll talk about it in just a moment here. When some people tried. Um, so let's just move on. We'll, we'll see an example of that. Of course, all of these ideas are contradicted by numerous passages in the Bible, and there's a whole bunch of references there. All of these passages make it quite clear that when someone dies, his thoughts perish. That person will not have another thought until the day of his resurrection. That resurrection will take place either at the second coming for the righteous 
or the third coming for the wicked. So how does this passage fit with Jude 6? Jude 6 from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> Remember the angels who did not stay within the limits of their proper authority, but abandoned their own dwelling place. They are bound with eternal chains in the darkness below, where God is keeping them for that great day on which they will be condemned. Okay, that great day. What day is we talking about? Judgment. So it sounds like even Satan and his angels are going to be judged on that great day, huh? We do not know that, uh, we do know that God had inspired Noah back in his day. Hebrews 11, 7, it was faith that made Noah hear God's warnings about things in the future that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he and his family were saved. As a result, the world was condemned and Noah received from God the righteousness that comes by faith. And 2 Peter 2, 5, God did not spare the ancient world, but brought the flood on the world of godless people. The only ones he saved were Noah, who preached righteousness and seven other people. Um, and I'm just going to say, we'll talk more about this next week, actually. Uh, there was a time when some people intentionally tried to corrupt the Bible, but the fact that there's a whole lot of other places which disagreed with that have shown that that attempt was, was, was not true, and we'll, we'll see that next week. Another somewhat confusing passage is found in Revelation 6, 9-11. And a lot of people avoid this passage simply by ignoring the book of Revelation. Are there really souls gathered under an altar somewhere in heaven? And can they cry out to God? Jim, I think that's yours. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Then the Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted a loud voice, Almighty God, holy and true. How long will it be until you judge the people on earth and, the, and punish them for killing us? Each of them was given a white robe and they were told to rest a little lo while longer until the complete number of the fellow servants and the fellow Christians had been killed as they, as they had been. Good News Bible. So it sounds like we're waiting for a certain day to come, doesn't it? The first thing to notice about this passage is that it refers to blood instead of incense. So it must refer to the altar outside in the courtyard and not the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. It was around that outside altar that the blood of sacrifices was sprinkled. And there are those who, when they look at this, they say, well, the the sanctuary talks about heaven, but the courtyard outside is talking about this earth. If that's true, then these, these souls who are crying out are not in heaven, they're down on this earth. Anyway, the, the, the Bible study guide, Charles? The souls under the altar also are symbolic. By taking them literally, we would have to conclude that the martyrs are not fully happy in heaven. They are still crying out for vengeance. <laughs> this hardly sounds as if they are enjoying the rewards of heaven. The desire for vengeance can make your life miserable, but your death as well. Adults oh. uh, Bible study guide. So think about that. I mean, wanting, crying for vengeance, feeling like you need to do something to somebody can make your life very miserable here on this earth. Is it going to be like that even when you get to heaven? I mean, wow. Notice what the Bible says about the sprinkling of the blood in Revelation 8, 1 to 6, and Revelation 4, 18, 30, and 34. I'm going to look at Revelation 8, 1 to 6 real quick. I think we've got time for that. When the Lamb broke open the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Another angel, who had a golden incense burner, came and stood at the altar. He was given a lot of incense to add to the prayers of all God's people and to offer it on the gold altar that stands before the throne. So now this is, this is the altar of incense, which is in heaven, right? 
The smoke of the burning incense went up with the prayers of God's people from the hands of the angel standing before God. Then the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. There were tumblings and peals of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So, uh, and Revelation 4, and again, I guess we have time for that. Jim, well, I mean, let's, let's go to these things, these verses. Is it going to take me there? No, it's not. Okay. You can read the next passage there then. There are no white, red, black, or pale horses there with warlike riders. This is in heaven. Right. Mm. Jesus does not appear there in the form of a lamb with a bleeding knife wound. The four beasts do not represent actual winged creatures of the animal characteristic, correct, give me, characteristics no, was this noted. Noted. Yeah, okay, right. I had the cursor there. Yeah. Therefore, likewise, excuse me, likewise, there are no souls lying at the base of an altar in heaven. The whole scene was a pictorial and symbolic representation from F.D. Nichol from the Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 778. Okay, this is an important point. Uh, we're going to see this a lot with passages that are questionable. If there's two or three or four or five different things which clearly can't be true, then is it, is it all right to pick out one part that you want, that you like, and say, well, this must be true? Uh, that's, that's not very, you know, picking and choosing isn't the way we're supposed to be reading the Bible, right? You're a little and they're a little. You're a little and they're a little. A well. collection of littles. <laughs> You're everything and they're everything. That's what we should do. Yes. But again, we have to go back to the big picture, you know. Yeah. No, notice also this comment from George Ladd, a non adventist comment, commentator, regarding Revelation 6, 9 to 11. In the present instance, Revelation 6, 9 to 11, the altar is clearly the altar of the sacrifice where sacrificial blood was poured. The fact that John saw the uh, souls of the martyrs under the altar has nothing to do with the state of the dead or their situation in the intermediate state. Let me interrupt for a second. Yes, sir. So here's, he's, he's, he's picking up on that idea that the, the courtyard out there represents this earth. It's not it was not inside, it's not the altar of incense we're talking about in inside the, the holy place or the most holy place which are regarded as being in heaven. So that's why he made that statement. Go ahead. It is merely a vivid way of picturing the fact that they had been martyred in the name of their God. A commentary on the revolution by... Yeah, I wish we had time to, to, to discuss the whole picture of Revelation because Many people feel like this is a key passage for the rest, reading the rest of the book of Revelation. These people are crying out, why don't you do something, God? And so then God responds and does all sorts of things. Um, I wish we had time to talk about all that, but we don't. Try to imagine times when people are willing to die for their beliefs. Can you think of a time when that was true? Well, how about the apostles? Right, right. Yeah. Apostles, the Reformation. The Reformation. Reformation. Of course, there are, there are people now who are extremists who are willing to die for what they believe. We usually call them Islamic extremists. Or something of that nature. Yeah. Um, why, why does, when someone is willing to die for something he believes, why would we call that an extremist? Because ordinary people wouldn't make that kind of mistake, right? What, what do we think is going to happen when we come closer and closer to the end of this world's history? Is Satan going to be happier and happier? Well, the Lord says his un, unjust promise, uh, John chapter 10, verse 22, and you will be hated of all nations mm -hmm. for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. Well, how does that compare, the people who were willing to die for what they believe. How does that compare with the very flexible religion of many postmoderns in our day? Mm -hmm. Is there anything for which people today would be willing to die? 
are all truths only relative or culturally determined? Were people who died because of what they believed foolish? Is it really worth dying for? Regarding, regarding the souls that seem to be crying out under the altar for what, what are or were they crying out, are or were they looking for revenge or for legal justice? God is asked to conduct a legal process leading to a verdict that will vindicate his martyred saints. That's from Joel. Yeah. In Revelation 6, 9 to 11, the slain martyrs are instructed to rest a while. The word rest is anapao in Greek and is sometimes even translated as to die. In Revelation 20, verse 4. It seems they will come to life to reign with Christ for a thousand years. They were from the Bible study yeah. guide, they were not living souls or spirits already, or that statement would be unnecessary. Thus, the description of their resting for a little while longer when combined with the idea of sleep used throughout the Bible for death leads the reader to understand that the beheaded saints were to stay in their graves a little longer, that is, until the second coming of Christ from the Bible Study Guide, teachers. Okay, in this lesson, we have considered several challenging passages of Scripture. However, none of them are that difficult to understand, given the context of all of Scripture and our understanding of the great controversy, as Charles has mentioned already a couple of times. Does this lesson help you to understand how you could respond to someone who comes with one of these passages as his or her defense of their belief in the immortality of the soul? Have any of you had that experience? Yes. So how have you responded? I'd say, take a look at the bigger picture. Yeah. Does this concept fit in there? If it does not, then let's take a look at the picture. Yeah, why, why, what do they do? And I, I never for, I forget one time I was teaching a class and, and trying to explain some of these things and someone else who was actually a theologian had come to visit that class just for one occasion. And his response was, we all know perfectly well that the devil doesn't exist. Okay, let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of drawing near to you, of thinking about the truth that you have given us through your word. Help us to understand these challenging passages correctly so that when we have opportunity to meet with people who believe them, we may with gentleness and fear, um, teach them about the truth. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.